Ron. Okay, uh, we're going to start the council meeting. We uh, had an executive session earlier, which is why we're starting a little late. Uh, so the first thing on the agenda is announcements. Patty, you have um, announcements? Yes, I have two announcements. Uh, one is don't forget that this is spring cleanup week in the village. Um, if you have large household items, you can put them out with your regular trash day. If today happened to be your regular trash day, go ahead and put them out and call the utilities office and let them know. And we will get those picked up uh, by Rumpke um, throughout the rest of the week. Um, also, another announcement, a reminder, if you want to participate in uh, being one of the um, lead or copper homes that we um, annually sample here in the village, um, it would require that you uh, collect a sample from a faucet on the inside of your house once a year when you are contacted by the water treatment superintendent. And then we would have that water tested and let you know if you have lead or copper from your pipe seeping, seeping into your water. If you would like to be on the contingency list for that, please contact water superintendent Brad Alt at 767-7208 or at his village email, which is available on our website. Okay. I have something. Oh. Yes. Go for it. Actually, I have, I'm, I'm trying real hard not to spend five minutes talking about this. But um, <laughs> over the past um, several months in various iterations, the topic of implicit bias has come up in the village. Um, so I would like to announce that um, after work done by myself, Judith Hempling, Patty, uh, Chief Carlson, and uh, Ruth Ann Lillick, uh, we ha went through a total of four proposals and we came up with one that uh, we've accepted. Patty, Patty's been negotiating with uh, the contractor. Um, it's Culture Learning Partners. They will be here sometime in the spring. I don't know the exact schedule, so I won't get into that. But there will be multiple sessions, multiple phases of implicit bias and cultural intelligence training offered to all. Everybody say all. All. Uh, village staff, including police. Uh, and council. And council. Well, I'll try to get out of it. Um, <laughs> So again, just want to emphasize that I think this is a big deal because it checks a lot of boxes for a lot of people that have been talking about this thing, this kind of thing for a long time. It again is for all uh, staff and council, including police. But in addition to that, uh, Chief Carlson has been working with uh, Dayton Police and will be, they will be handling a separate uh, set of uh, bias related training that is more uh, police officer or peace officer uh, uh, directed and they will take care of that on their own but again just wanted to make sure that everyone knew about that and that we are moving forward with that and then Judy we talked about a photo you want to just do that to oh. the end or um, I can I can you just keep on announcing. okay all right, I'm going to stretch this out. Anyway, um, Daniel Cox, a uh, Antioch student, uh, reached out to Chief Carlson asking if uh, there were any bicycles available. Um, so Chief Carlson uh, offered up, is it eight bicycles? I think. Yes, there's two more on the way. All right, all right. Eight plus two bicycles for use for Antioch College students to get around, there's a bicycle shop there. In fact, it's not just for students, it's for anybody oh. on campus. So you can go by, grab a bike, pick it up here and leave it there. Spencer can probably tell us more about this. Um, but there, and there's a bike shop to make sure they're all gonna be in good repair. So uh, we are literally a more mobile society now, thanks to Chief Carlson. Alrighty. Okay, Lisa, do you Nothing. have any announcements? No, not tonight. Okay. No, I okay. do not. All right. So. We are moving on to the consent, consent agenda. Does anyone want all of the things on the consent agenda read? Oh, titled? one does not. <laughs> <laughs> Judy, Judy does not. Yeah, we no, do if not. If you need we, anything okay. read or discussed or explained, it comes off the consent okay, agenda. Okay, so right. a consent agenda are a number of things, including the minutes of the last meeting and a number of resolutions that are more or less and ordinances that first reading of ordinance that are rather poor pro forma sort of typo kind of things that have been 
being changed. So um, do I have a motion to approve the consent agenda? So moved. Second. Okay. Uh, can we do a roll call? Um, just one vote is good. Okay. All in favor say aye. 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 Okay. Moving on to the review of the agenda. I have one thing to add, which is nominating uh, Matthew Lawson to the Environmental Commission. Not, what, what's a good time to do that? Under um, new business, maybe? Yeah, we'll do it under new business. Anything else? Nothing for here. For, for me. Okay, I have a question about the inclusion of the electric, the staff report on electric needs. Was that going to be something to discuss at this meeting? Yes, I'll be addressing that during my update about utility affordability okay, on the it. roundup. Great, great, okay. Oh, and yes. so Judy, the one thing that maybe is on here that was gonna get moved if Judith didn't come, do we need to move Thank that? you, mm -hmm. thank you, indeed. Mm -hmm. um, we need to take off from um, public hearings and legislation, the emergency reading of 2018-15, because that requires a uh, supermajority, super which we don't have. So, okay. boom. Mm -hmm. All right. The next thing, then, is petitions and communications, and I will go over those. Things that have come into council either on hard copy or uh, electronically. So we had a uh, email from Chris Zerbukan, who is going to be doing a uh, quilt uh, showing the glass farm with opportunities for people to stick on designs that they think would be a good thing for the glass farm. And this will be at Antioch Midwest, and it'll be up in the fall. Then Macy Reynolds would like the tree committee to uh, come to council to talk about the possibility of working with council uh, and Tree City USA. She wanted to come to the next meeting and um, I did email her and say I thought probably we would have a pretty full <coughs> thing next meeting, but we can work that out. Um, Dino Pilata sent uh, something about rent control and then NAMI has sent their newsletter and also a film that they're showing at the Little Art about suicide. That'll be Sunday afternoon, June 3rd. Green County Public Health sent a notice that hepatitis A, it, hepatitis A alert. Uh, there are more uh, instances happening in Ohio this year. They also sent an uh, announcement about a youth summit, which has actually already occurred on drugs and alcohol. Uh, the Yellow Springs Active Transportation sent out a notice of the bike and walk to school day, which is uh, Wednesday, May 9th, as well as a community mapping event for mapping sidewalks and roads on May 9th at Mills Lawn from 8.30 to 10.30. Mercy Health mobile mammography van will be coming around, and if people are interested in that, they can call uh, five two three nine three three two that's nine three seven those are the petitions and communications I, I have a quick comment I feel like we just recently talked about tree city status we did so and, if we bring that I, forward can we have our old <laughs> I, I told Macy that that had occurred uh -huh. and that if we if they wanted to come forward that we also should bring Back, right. Whatever what that conversation have that. Thank you. Yeah. Perfect. And I did create a brief on it as well. I think Good. that was in the packets when we had the discussion last fall. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, now we are coming to public hearings and legislations. And the second reading of uh, public hearing for ordinance 2018-14. Do you want this by title only? Yes. Okay, this is repealing section 304 paid holidays of the Village of Yellow Springs personnel policy manual and enacting a new section 304 paid holidays, thereby amending the personnel policy manual. All right. Uh, does council or Patty have anything they want to say about this? 
this is just the uh, the second read or yes the second reading of the ordinance to add um, Christmas Eve as a holiday um, it's usually a day that we have two or three staff in the entire building because everybody else takes vacation and we don't get any citizens because they're all um, spending that day traveling themselves or uh, planning to have folks at their house the next day uh, so council was asked and agreed to add that as one of our paid holidays council anything okay, okay i'm going to open the public hearing does the public have anything to say about this apparently not close the public hearing did you get a motion no i still need a motion okay uh, do we have a motion to uh, approve this? So moved. Second. Okay. Okay. Um, Krieger. Yes. Stokes. Yes. McQueen. Yes. All right. All right. We are moving on to the reading of resolution 2018-09, uh, creating a permanent glass farm conservation Area Management Committee. Do I have a motion to approve? Well, <clears throat> well, wait, because you need to have it read in, and that was my question for you then. Do you want it by title only, or do you need the whole shebang? Would you read it by title only? Thank Indeed. You. This is creating a permanent glass farm conservation area management committee. <clears throat> do I have a motion? Move that we go into the special. Yes. Second. Right. Okay. So, does uh, council have anything that they would like to say about this? I have a couple questions. Mm -hmm. yes. One is just to clarify that this is this is sort of a renaming and creating a permanent, what was the Beaver group? That was the wrong name for it, the Beaver Management Task, management Force. Task Force. This is a reinvention of that. Well, it, it, I'm sorry. Go ahead. It, the, the issue that we have is that one of the concerns I had when we started talking about the permanent wetland at the glass farm was the maintenance of the property because um, a lot of things in the village seem to start with volunteers which is great but then at the end of the day it ends up being maintained by village staff and um, village staff doesn't really have the time to consistently manage that wetland or the expertise so one of the things that council agreed to do when we started looking at the wetland was to eventually create a permanent management committee and so the beaver management I think at the end of the day there will be some members that were on the beaver management task force that will be on this but there will be other members on this that are not currently on the beaver management task force because it will be more of the entire area as opposed to just managing mm -hmm. the beaver portion and the beaver management task force then is going away yes yes I, I, Go ahead. I have one more question. Yeah. Okay. No, I was just going to say, I guess in my full reading of it, it seemed like it was intentionally being folded in with this because the name got expanded mm -hmm. to include beaver management hospitality. Right. <laughs> and there were, and there were a couple of concerns that were brought up at the when this was read and then tabled before um, that the detention pond was. A, a created detention pond there was a concern whether it can be expanded which yes it can under the conservation and easement it can be expanded that would be revisited on a case-by-case -case basis um, there was also a concern that the management committee not their actions not conflict with other council values and goals such as um, developing the housing on the glass farm so um, the first concern about the detention pond has been addressed in the first and second whereases in the rewording of those and the second concern about the con potential conflict has been addressed in section two um, of the now therefore section i, I appreciate that because that's that was the clarifying question i wanted to ask mm -hmm. um, because i really i really heard and it really stuck with me that conversation um, that we had about how no matter how we try to approach it the development of the glass farm is ecological you know it's development is ecologically disruptive mm -hmm. so I think it's um, I think it's good that there's a group of citizens that are coming together in an organized way to try to maintain that balance during that development period mm -hmm. okay 
Thank you. Is there anyone from the community that would like to say anything about this? Okay, I'm going to bring it back to council. Can we do a voice vote? Mm -hmm. Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, reading of resolution 2018-16. And how would you like this one? Would, would you? Patty, what, what would you like? Well, she's here, so let's make it special and read it in full. Okay. All right, this is appointing Colleen Harris as finance director. Whereas the Village of Yellow Springs publicly posted the notice for the vacant position of Village Finance Director, and whereas the Village Manager formed an interview committee that identified and interviewed three candidates, and whereas Village staff and the interview committee met with the prospective candidates and provided feedback to the Village Manager to consider for the purpose of making the final hiring decision as prescribed under the Village Charter, and whereas the Village Manager has considered committee and staff feedback and determined that Colleen Harris should be extended an offer of employment as the finance director for the Village of Yellow Springs and makes the same recommendation to Council. Now therefore, Council for the Village of Yellow Springs, Ohio, hereby resolves that. Section 1. Colleen Harris is hereby extended an offer of employment to serve as finance director for the Village of Yellow Springs to serve at the pleasure of the Village Manager. Section 2, the duties of the finance director shall be those as provided for in the charter for the finance director and pursuant to the employment agreement attached to this resolution as Exhibit A. Section 3, the finance director shall be considered a full-time employee. She shall receive the salary and benefits as provided for in Exhibit A. Section 4, the village manager is hereby authorized to execute the employment agreement and to take other such actions on behalf of the village as may be necessary to assure this appointment. Section 5, this resolution shall be in full force and effect upon its adoption. It is the intent of council that the employment agreement will be effective upon signature by all parties. Thank you. So I would like to introduce to you Colleen Harris, who is sitting here in the front row with her husband, Ray. Uh, Colleen comes to us from the village of New Carlisle. She has 15 years of government finance experience. Um, she will be working for us part-time and New Carlisle part-time for the next month. And then mm -hmm. on June the 4th, I believe, we'll be coming here full-time as our finance director. And uh, she's agreeing to start tomorrow afternoon, <laughs> I believe. And it's taking that long? Wow. <laughs> and we are very, very excited to have Colleen join us. So, Thank you. So if Welcome. you would like to just come up real quick and shake hands. We're missing two council members tonight. Hi. Nice to meet you in person. Hi, I'm Mary. And I will look forward to seeing you tomorrow afternoon. And, and Ray, welcome to the family. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you. So, um, we're, we're very excited to have Colleen joining us and uh, look forward to working with her. The, the, everyone who met Colleen was like, yeah, we like her. Yeah. So, so, do you pronounce your name Colleen or Col Colleen? Colleen. I pronounce it Colleen. 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 We everybody says Colleen, and I hear that, so it's it's actually either one. Oh. Okay. Thank you. So, uh, I'd like a a motion. To I'd like to move that we accept this adopt this resolution. Second. Okay. All in favor, say aye. 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 Great. Pass. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for coming. Go play. <laughs> the next thing on our agenda is uh, citizen concerns. This is a time when anyone who has something that they want to bring to council's attention can do so that's not on the agenda. And we have a three minute time limit. Uh, if you have something, we ask that you come to the microphone and give your name, and uh, we'll be happy to hear you. Is there anyone who has a concern that they'd like to express? Great. Let me give y'all one of my flyers here. Y'all okay. know why I'm here. Thank okay. you. Great. Now, uh, I'll move my picture now. All right, great, now, now, thank now, you. Now, before she look at that, is, uh, is she over 18? She's over 18. All right. Just barely, though. I don't feel too bad now. <laughs> Just barely. How you doing? Well, thank you. Okay. 
Okay. Oh, my name is uh, Larry Ely. I'm from the city of Dayton. Oh. Okay. Now, I'm um, one of the gentlemen that's running for governor tomorrow. Okay. Mm. And uh, as, as y'all can see, um, they found out I was a former male dancer from 1985, you know, <laughs> back in the days. Okay. So, uh, you know, uh, but that's what they found out about me. I guess that's the biggest thing they got. <laughs> so I guess we can run with that. Now you know they called me Luscious Larry back in the in, back in them days, and now the the media is pushing this like I'm still dancing. Now I'm, I'm 55 now, and I can't dance now. Now now they should have did this 30 years ago, when I needed them to uh, to to do it. Mm -hmm. But um, on the uh, other half of this, um, this is my second bid for Ohio governor. Now I ran against Casey and Ed Fitzgerald in uh, 20. 2014. Now, this is Casey's last term, and uh, everybody said it won't change. So here it is tomorrow, May the 8th. I'll be the first um, African American or colored governor that this state ever had. And uh, my first plan is is to make sure the state is uh, a foreign these small cities and villages and counties with, with the proper funding for streets and housing and roads. Uh, I plan to do an 88 county redistricting and rezoning, and I will eliminate the inner cities. Uh, I'm gonna fight drugs to the very extent of the law, so as far as we can go with it until we clean it up. Uh, those drug dealers know me very well. I'm from the inner city. I was born there in 1963. And I'm going right in, and we coming right out. Now, anybody got any problems with that? They're going to have to deal with the new governor and his staff. Now, I'm, I'm looking for all these counties to join together as one state body. We're going to end the homeless population. Three minutes up? Mm -hmm. Wow. Okay, y'all. Well, it's working. Okay. That, that clock on time, ain't it? <laughs> Wish I could see a little bit more, but I'm glad I met y'all. Yes, y'all Y'all seem like y'all a nice little fit here. Yeah. So you. it's something going on good here. Indeed. Mm -hmm. and, and I plan to come back and build y'all a couple more times. Okay. Thanks, y'all. Right. Thank, Thank you for Thank coming. Thank you, Mr. Healy. Bye bye. No, you're not. <laughs> <laughs> no publicity is bad publicity. Indeed. Hey, let me show you somebody get out of here. Now, I didn't make that flyer, though. Everybody thought I did. <laughs> <laughs> now, look at this. <laughs> I, I found it interesting, too. I made all these years. <laughs> okay, should we be okay. Judy? Oh, well. Thanks for coming. Yeah. That's a nice okay, picture. Thank you. <laughs> Don't you lose my picture. Yeah, we will. <laughs> uh, does anyone else have a uh, citizen's concern? Okay. So now we are moving to special reports. Is that you, Steve? <laughs> yeah. Come on, get it together, Steve. All right. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm here to speak on the end of the year report for HRC. I believe you should have them in the packet. No, mm -mm. we didn't. <laughs> I was definitely told. Huh? I was told that you definitely would. Well then, uh, let me give you a, a brief, not so brief, but a, a synopsis here of basically last year. Uh, in March, we did the Peace Week, um, in which we were able to help with 700 for the T-shirts that all of the kids wore, and they all stood into a large peace sign. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> there was a Bulldog Boogie in April of last year, and we were able to contribute 250 for that, and that the point of that was to have a 
school dance, but with Mills Lawn, Antioch School, and homeschool kids. And there actually was a really nice turnout, and we were even able to get DJ Creeping Bear to come to that. And then there's the following that, that was still in both in April, the Parkour Jam. The Parkour Jam, uh, we were able to contribute 5.30 towards that. And that was headed by Kendra Cipollini. And basically, uh, there was a very popular parkour character from the United States that they were able to get to come here, do things at the school. So it was like weekend long. Friday, he did some demonstrations at the school. And then Saturday, there was an entire event, day long uh, event. And so we, they even built <laughs> platforms for the kids to be able to do parkour and like smaller ones that kids could do stuff on. Then of course our yearly block parties that we um, always love to be a part of. There were 20 this year, well last year. And, uh, and so we were able to contribute 500 towards that to help the block parties that we like to go to and, and make sure folks are getting to know each other in such a small place. Uh, September, we were able to give 500 towards the zombie walk for handy, handicap accessible bathrooms. Uh, that was a problem that they had for a couple of years. And so we were able to be, this was the first year that they were able to have handy accessible uh, bathrooms. And <clears throat> a thousand went to the restorative justice symposium which was a three-day-long three event, um, and we were able to contribute a 1,000 towards that. The symposium began on Friday, and the final day wasn't until Sunday, but basically the speakers were able, a lot of the speakers were able to speak uh, because of our contribution. Then in October, there's also the annual, for six years now, Boys and Girls Night, Mills Lawn. Uh, <clears throat> And also the Day of Empowerment, which they're kind of synopsis. They used to have a night of empowerment, but they wanted it to be a school, uh, school event and day long. And so they were able to break those into two separate things. And we were able to contribute uh, 150 to the Boys and Girls Night, 250 to the Day of Empowerment. And then we were able to <clears throat> give scholarships, partial scholarships. Uh, for 2000 towards the eighth grade DC trip last year. And once again, right, a very successful trip. They were actually able to go to a play that year, which was the first time they were able to do that. And part of our cost was able to help that out as well. Uh, the Elaine Comegy's Film Festival. This was once again, so we're talking last year, this year. Uh, I'm proud to say 365 is able to handle a lot more, which is also something HRC inspires to, if you want it annual, try to ask for less, <laughs> meaning you can handle more on your own. And so, um, but because of that, movies like 13th, Zora Roots, Tuskegee Airmen, Black Girl, Hidden Figures, as well as Get Out, uh, were able to be played and we were able to contribute 500 mm -hmm. towards that. Uh, towards the, we are still in September here. No, actually, I'm pretty sure this was November. The Kingian Nonviolence, Kingian Nonviolence Conflict Reconciliation Training, which was over at Antioch, and HRC was able to help with 300 for that, and that was something that was inspired not only for people to go to, but uh, a lot of members and staff of the of Yellow Springs uh, also were able to go. Once again, due to the, uh, the help HRC was able to give. And something we're really proud of every year, Kwanzaa, uh, we were able to help them once again this year. Jerry Sims, former council member, was honored. And you know, as the elder of Yellow Springs award that they give out each year, and there was also a speech on the Civil Rights Museum in Jackson, Mississippi that um, John Fleming was able to head, which was also fascinating. We were extremely glad and always glad to give to that. And following uh, a few months later, the 
uh, day of empowerment, there was a there was another workshop because of how popular that was. There was another workshop that was done, and we were able to contribute to that as well. Uh, 150. Gunzo himself wrote a letter saying that uh, 800 people were impacted by all the different things that we were able to contribute and how much of a positive impact in a many variety of different ways. And thank you, HRC. We are looking forward to a lot of things this up and coming year. Excuse me. Um, we were just able to help with a beloved community project. We'll get into that, but if there is a next year's end of year report, but basically um, wanting to address suicide um, prevention as well as just uh, having a community group uh, because we've had so many so recently that it seems like everyone's been impacted by that uh, as of late. And then of course the annual things we still want to maintain as best as we do, block parties, boys and girls night, et cetera. Um, we initially said that we would like to stay with the budget we had of last year, but I heard the budget's being done a lot differently this year, so I'm still going to ask that, but well, you know, however that goes, I know it's changed. That's the only thing I know about how the budget works. Uh, we had 8,500 to work with. We would still be uh, like to be able to do that because we still do plan to do a lot so for is, the community. Is that a budget request that you're making? That is a budget request that we're making. Ah. So even though I heard, I still want to make it. Even Great. though I heard that yes. there may be differences, I'd still like to maintain what we uh, worked with last year would still be needed this year. So for eight, 8,500? 8, 8,500 is what we're requesting to maintain all of these different events uh, that we spoke of. Are there any questions? I hope that was thorough. Was a lot, a lot of things happen. <laughs> yeah, busy, busy commission. And I will make sure that the packet at least is forwarded to Judy for the record. Yeah, right. And finally, that the report rather done yeah. that as well. Let me know if I need to do that. That's yeah. Okay. I apologize. That wasn't here beforehand. No you did a good job recapping. Yeah. <laughs> you right. Well, you know how much work we like to put into it. So we're always happy to do it. And so yeah, HRC is always here. Whatever we can do to keep the village, especially event with events, making sure they maintain and inspire to do more. I think that's another thing we want to focus on this year, inspiring even more events. Okay. HRC forever. <laughs> Thanks, Steve. What, what's our current uh, remaining budget in the, uh, in the account that we have for I commissions? I don't know, and I don't have my budget with me, so I'm sorry I can't answer your question right now. Yeah, I wouldn't be able to answer that. I'd want to know that before we make a final determination on budget for the commission. Well, I think you're asking for next year, right? Because you got no. 85 no. for this no. year. No, you're asking for this year, right? Correct. It would be for this year to be right, maintain what we had because this is last year. So, right. Well, but but we should have already put in the budget request that you gave us for this year. For right? this year. Yeah. So what so, you're saying is you want to carry the 8,500 no. next year. No. He's asking for 2018. Oh. As soon as we it's already out. there, is what I'm saying. The 8,500 is already well, there for 2018. We need to check on that. That's, do you, yeah, I'd like, I'd just like to know, because I think maybe it just. I would agree that the budget was set back in uh, early November. Right. We need to check to make sure that that's what they allowed. Yeah. yeah. Well, I'm pretty sure that it was. Um, HRC for the last several years has been requesting 8,500. Right. And this year, or I think at our last meeting, uh, Planning Commission requested 10,000, which is, frankly, I, I would be happy having that outside of, I mean, if, or if it makes us go over the 25,000, because that's an unusual request coming in from Planning Commission. But I, I, def, I support HRC having the 8,500, even if we go over the 25. Because HRC, as, as Steve has mentioned, is supporting all these other organizations in doing so. So, so I don't not support it, but we don't have the report in the packet, and we don't know what our budget is. So, unless there is a, an, an, an expenditure anticipated in the next two weeks that we might be holding something up, I just think it would be better if we wait to approve it until we know our budget, 
and we have it in the packet, and then we can go forward, which is different than saying I'm against it. <laughs> right. No, I'm just saying. I'm pretty sure it, 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 it'll be relayed to us. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, we just want to just want to know. Steve. Understood. Thanks. <laughs> Any other questions or further? Good job. Thanks for coming. Right. Thank you. We appreciate you. Thank you for listening. Truly. And am I, am I hearing that you'd be interested in having that information in the next village manager's report? Uh, yeah, I wrote it down. Yeah. yeah. I'm just, I know that when we were preparing the budget last year, we asked for, um, you know, budget requests from all of the commissions and mm -hmm. HRC submitted 8,500. So, um, and that's when I, when I first came, HRC had 10,000 and we actually took HRC down to 8,500 mm -hmm. two years ago, but we can double check and make sure what's in there. Okay. That's not, we'll do, it's yeah, not we'll just do, up to me. That would be we'll my do preference. That. <laughs> we'll do that. Thanks. Then now we move on to old business. And the first item on old business is the housing advisory board report. Uh, and next steps. So initially when I thought that, that all of the council members would be here, I had thought that it would be good to have about 45 minutes because this is the first time council has actually had time to sort of have a conversation about the housing needs assessment, uh, the survey within that, the data within it, and then the community <coughs> conversations on housing. So, uh, you know, it doesn't need to take 45 minutes if it doesn't. But I will say that Kevin Magruder is here, who is on the Housing Advisory Board. So that's, thank you, Kevin, for showing up. And so in the council packet, there are three documents. The first document, which we could say maybe is sort of a cover letter that I, I wrote is the one uh, that, from the Housing Advisory Board. And uh, the, next doc, uh, the next document is a summary of the community conversations that uh, Patty and Judith and Karen Wintrow put together. And then we have the transcription from the conversations themselves. So my thought was that we first just uh, open this up for comments from council and from the community on the whole ball of wax. In other words, the uh, housing needs assessment, everything contained in that, as well as the community conversations. And then after we have that conversation, I thought we could affirm as council, uh, I assume, yes, we want to do something to address these issues. Uh, I have also included the out, the sort of bone, bare bones of uh, a possible process, and I'll, I can talk about that more. And then lastly, I'd like uh, direction from council on how you would like the Housing Advisory Board to proceed. So, so starting off, uh, and you know, I have been pretty intimately involved in this, so I don't think I need to say much right now, but I'd be very interested in Kevin and Lisa for you to reflect on whatever thoughts you have about the housing needs assessment and the results of the community conversations on housing. Well, <clears throat> first of all, I think it, I want to laud you and um, Judith and everyone else, the, uh, the committee, um, and Kevin did a great job with the presentation that I was at at the Baptist Church. I'm sure he did a great job at all of them. Um, you know, one thing, well, if, uh, there were a few things, but one thing that, that I, I will admit I was a little surprised to see come up as often as it did um, were the concerns about the green belt and how um, our desire for it has uh, perhaps turned uh, a bit of a, turned into a bit of a negative uh, based on the comments. Um, um, and I didn't, I, I don't have the narrative information, but just some of the uh, summary information 
uh, where there were more than on more than one occasion where someone suggested that it we should probably reconsider that. I'm not suggesting that. I'm just saying I was struck by how often uh -huh. they came okay. up. Yeah. Anything else? I will jump back in later. Okay. Um, I, I was really impressed by the the organization and the community engagement that that these narratives in this pack represent and I'd also like to thank you Dr. Magruder for the work that you did it was so con important to have that consistent facilitation and I just really it really reinforced for me like <coughs> one of the reasons that I moved here with my family you know the people showed up and talked and and disagreed and and after being kind of turned off of some of the social media engagement to see people show up in person and talk and respectfully engage with different perspectives was extremely refreshing and my only regret was that I wasn't able to attend all of the sessions um, and these notes are are extremely are extremely helpful um, and I I would like to hear you know more you know more talk about next steps I mean I like kind of think like project planning so like what's next um, I, I certainly see an ongoing role for um, this this group that's already convened and done such excellent work um, for better or worse since I've joined council I'm suddenly turning into the like infrastructure <laughs> Guru. I, it's not a guru yet, but for it, it's really front and center in my mind in everything I read. And the criticality of infrastructure. So for me, the, the most, thing, most important things that I'm thinking about is, and it also came out of these notes, is one, as we move forward with, with development, how are we going to get that infrastructure planned with the right expertise and get it right the first time mm -hmm. and get that foundational like no pun intended stuff right mm -hmm. and how are we going to engage our planning commission and who's going to be involved to get that expertise mm -hmm. that's related to glass farm and then I, you know I agree about I, I was surprised about the comments about the green belt too but the other thing that came through loud and clear um, were the participants concerns about the rest of the village infrastructure um, not only though the village owned uh, infrastructure um, but also privately owned property and I've been you know thinking a lot about what is it the village can actually do and control and what can't the village actually do and control because we don't we can't do everything um, and a lot of the property that's out there that's kind of getting run down is in the hands of, of private individuals. But this is informing my thoughts about the uh, utility rates and capital costs, you know, and our, our need to think about as a, a, a government group, what can we do to help, pe you know, people who live here and who own property to keep our assets that we have maintained. Mm -hmm. I heard that at these sessions and you know it wasn't about glass farm and it wasn't quite as exciting as thinking about something new but I think thinking about our older assets um, we can't totally lose sight of it. Yeah. You know in the group that I was in I brought up something um, uh, code enforcement was, was the was the topic of conversation and it, and it I don't know that it shows up here. I think may, I may have seen it once. Um, and, and that stemmed from the conversation um, from the re report, from information from the report that um, even though we talk about how expensive it is to live in Yellow Springs, I think there's a false narrative here. Um, when you compare uh, the cost of an apartment here in Yellow Springs to an apartment and I'll pick on Fairborn, just somebody outside of, of Yellow Springs, it, it, where you have two apartments that seem uh, on paper to be the same uh, because you're paying $650 for each of them. You know, but outside of the village where you can pay that same money and get so much more. Uh, and then here in the village, that same 650 gets you, you know, something that um, 
has fewer amenities, uh, is older, and with respect to, Lisa, your concerns about what we can and can't do or what, what can and can't be done, not just by uh, village council or village government, but by the community, we can maintain what we have. We can fix what we have. Uh, we're in the midst of cleaning out our garages, you know, but are we fixing our gutters and doing all those other things and um, making sure our bad word, sidewalks uh, and steps um, and, and other safety related issues are being handled. Things that we are responsible for and I mean the universal we, uh, apartment owners, property owners. Um, so, you know, there was a, a, a comment in, in the report here that says uh, something about the things we can do to keep Yellow Springs, Yellow Springs. Um, well, I think that's, there's an element of that that's been lost uh, when, when we've allowed things to, um, to degrade, you know, deferred maintenance, you know, as an employee of Antioch College, uh, seems to be, you know, something that's in the air and, and nothing good can come from it, mm -hmm. you know, so yeah, I think we do, should gra grasp hold of the things that we, the universal we can control to make, um, living in Yellow Springs, it was nice, the, the good story is that how fun it is, but I'd like to make it a better value. Let's talk later about how expensive it is, but let's make what I'm spending now a better value. Um, you know, maybe there's the threat or the concern about r rental rates going up if we enforce code, certain codes a bit more. Um, you know, I think that's, that's, that's up to the conscience of, of those folks responsible for that. And I, I don't think that should sway us from expecting folks to do what I think is the right thing. Um, so with respect to the community meetings, how many people actually showed up all, in total? Do um, we have that number? Probably about 150, 180. Somewhere, yeah. Something, the, something mm -hmm. under 200, 150 to 200 people. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, uh, Kevin, I'd just like to speak to the code enforcement issue for a minute. And it's interesting that you brought that up because I had a conversation with a citizen just the other day. And um, this citizen had been talking to another citizen who lives in an apartment here in the village. And um, they were t the citizen number two was talking about the condition of the, the apartment and the building in which they lived. And Citizen one was asking me, what can the village enforce? Okay, well, the village can essentially enforce what's on the outside. You know, we can make you cut your grass, we can make you clean up your junk, we can um, do certain things on the outside as far as the maintenance of your property. But the structure itself, the plumbing, the interior electrical wiring, and all of those things, those are county codes. And then, of course, you have the fire code, which is um, Chief Altman at the fire department. And so I said they need to, if they have concerns, give the county a call and the county will, you know, come out and take a look at things. And if they're not, you know, up to code, the county will make them bring it to code. Well, citizen one who came to me said, oh, they were very concerned about going to the county because if the county comes in and says, you can't live here anymore, then they have nowhere to go. And so that's part of the problem that we face is citizens a lot of times don't want to come forward and go to the county authorities because they're concerned that the county will sh shut the building down, for lack of a better word, um, until some of the things are fixed and they don't have anywhere to go. So, I mean, that's part of the issue that we're, we're also facing is because the, the property owners, some of the property owners, not all of them, um, don't want to take the maintenance on and defer it, as you were saying, and and now we have people who are living in these apartments that apparently in some cases are not necessarily habitable 100%. Um, I'd like to sort of enter in and then sort of move the conversation a little. I, I'd just like to address a couple things that the two of you brought up. One was about the Greenbelt concern. Um, my sense is that council needs to address this, not, not today, but to have a conversation about this. And actually, I've been talking to Krista McGaw about this. Uh, part, in part, I think there is uh, 
a lack of understanding about where the Greenbelt or the proposed Jacoby Greenbelt is, where the village boundaries are, because there's a fair amount of distance between the proposed Greenbelt and the village boundary. And then there is the urban service boundary, which is how far the village could extend the sewer system if it's gravity fed, which in most cases is beyond the village boundary. And there's still distance between the urban service boundary and the green belt. So when people are talking about the green belt, my sense is, one, people don't know where it is. They don't know those distinctions. Mm -hmm. And that's why I think I would, I really would like us to have a map right there, mm -hmm. a very large map that shows the village boundaries mm -hmm. and the other boundaries that we we're talking about. Um, but also along with this is there, I think we could agree, there has been a tradition of, well, I, I'd almost say contraction, mm -hmm. of not growing. And I think it's that, um, that value of the be, coming out of the fear, starting in the 70s, I guess, that Yellow Springs was going to be 15,000 people, that value of no growth, and we know that there have been several uh, developments proposed on the glass farm that were rejected. Mm -hmm. There was a land just outside the village, the Peter, what used to be called the Peterson Farm, at one point was going to be the proposal to annex, that was rejected. So that we have this multi-generational history of no growth, both housing and I would say economic development. And that is, I think, the kind of thing that we need to be shifting. I think it's more about that than <laughs> the actual green belt along to uh, the other, The other two things that you brought up, the infrastructure, I think um, the uh, as we've been developing a, a way to move forward, clearly uh, infrastructure needs to be moving forward before new housing, at least needs to be planned and in, before new housing. Then there's rehab. There's also what we have, both the infrastructure, but I'm more I'm thinking about the buildings. As we have been developing and finding out what are the different kinds of strategies that we could use for increasing the number of housing units. Rehab, clearly, rehab and I'll say reuse are some strategies. And, and so those are some, and you know, how, how to have that happen. So, so those, those are in the back burner, at mm -hmm. least the, uh, I had some ideas about that. But how about if we move to sort of what's central in the uh, housing needs assessment? Uh, I mean, the, the green belts, some of these are sort of tangential. I mean, to me, it seemed like the housing needs assessment was, there were some clear needs that aren't being addressed. I mean, I think we stated them, Patty, in the, that summary, mm -hmm. uh, in particular, senior housing, especially low in, lower income senior housing, mm -hmm. rent, senior rental and rental all across the board, but especially low and moderate income rental. Agree. Oh, and I mean, do you guys agree or? Yeah, we absolutely. And so to that point, um, especially when we think about uh, infrastructure and reuse. So there's this college here in town and they have this separate entity um, that's, that's trying to, uh, I think, push proposals about uh, cottages and perhaps reuse of some existing buildings on the college campus. Um, and I don't know if that came up a lot in the housing discussions. I didn't see it. I suspect that um, people fear that there's too much of an association between Antioch College Village and the college itself to where uh, if you have certain concerns for the college, you might uh, conflate those concerns with a Antioch College Village 
uh, housing proposal and uh, and I'd like for there to be some more clear delineation and discussion about that uh, again um, if you put you know Antioch College Village and uh, development on any uh, village owned property glass farm being an example um, you know Antioch College Village is a few months ahead <laughs> I'm, I'm saying that facetiously it's it's years ahead you know because there is existing infrastructure there um, so again I just wonder how much thought is being put toward that I mean and this is less me uh, in, in full disclosure less me pushing Antioch uh, College Village but more saying what's closest to being done where is there already infrastructure where are there already structures you know that could be uh, employed and again and I think I've, I know I've said this in, in, in council before at the end of the day we're talking about putting roofs over people's heads and we don't really care who owns the dirt you know that those structures are on uh, so I think that's something that's important and so in terms of you know the the the, 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 the use I think everyone uh, in every instance is looking at you know mixed income mixed use you know that will address uh, you know the, the seniors uh, there seem to be a consistent theme that uh, uh, senior condos are going to be a big piece of thing uh, because it seems like there were seniors saying hey I would like to move out downsize from my you know larger home and get into something a bit more manageable and allow you know families to come in there now, certainly we can't expect folks to make that commitment now, but I think if we just make, give the opportunity by, uh, by cementing, you know, condos uh, in our plans, whether they are senior specific or not, you know, just condos for the sake of condos. So those are a couple of things. Again, I think we're addressing the infrastructure. If, if we're looking at building on top of existing infrastructure, um, I think uh, we are in agreement that uh, seniors, that was a clear theme, that, that senior housing is important, but not senior housing air quotes, but places where seniors can go. So we build the places and, and, and build it and they'll come. I'd like to address something that you just brought up. One of the strategies um, that, um, that we have that we will suggest and we really have started doing is to be working to talking directly to developers, property owners, potential developers, uh, property owners who have potential developments um, and and this came a, about as advice from consultants who we were talking with when we were thinking of uh, trying to institute inclusionary zoning inclusionary zoning is a kind of zoning that says okay if you're going to have this development you have to have a certain number of uh, units dedicated to lower income and everyone that we talked with said, uh, we don't think that's gonna work in Yellow Springs, but what we think you should do is start talking to developers. What do they want? How can you work with them? How can a developer meet the needs that we're beginning to identify? Um, and of course we have Kevin here, who is involved in the development that you're talking about. But um, I'd like to give you an opportunity to say something, and then I'd just like to open it up to the community before we sort of move into um, what process we might see. Yeah, I, I only just have two, two points to add. Um, one is that I think um, in, as part of the early, early work and a, as soon as possible that some, some overarching definitions of what we mean by words like affordable, market rate, and what those words mean and of course they're not going to be like carved into stone but I think it will help us as a group I think it will help the community to know what we're talking about as we move into the housing plan this was really reinforced for me at the session that I attended when someone in the audience asked Dr. Magruder um, like what do you what do we mean by these different words and and Kevin acknowledged that even in the industry those words some of the defining words have somewhat of a variable definition, but you were able to define them. You know, some of the different sort of stratifications of, of, of cost that range from are we talking about Section 8 or are we talking about market rate or are we, what do we say when we say we need more affordable houses? Does that mean more people like me can afford to buy them or more people like somebody else? How much money, you know, What's the percentage of 
uh, an income that you're able to spend mm -hmm. along those lines. I think that would just be um, very, very helpful. Mm -hmm. And the, the other point that I'd like to make is, you know, I, I don't think that the Village of Yellow Springs is, uh, or the community has always done that well in intentionally convening and collaborating with the other stakeholders in the village. And so I, I know that this is, I think I know this is something that you have already thought of, but I just want to put it out there that I think that uh, it isn't to say that we shouldn't have our own plan for, for Glass Farm, that's our plan, right? But mm -hmm. I just think it's important to get the, um, as much as we can, the timeline and trajectory for anybody who's doing any development in the village, where are they now and what's their event horizon? so that whatever we plan complements that event horizon because if we work in a if if we don't pay attention to that then we may end up a, with a surplus mm -hmm. in the future which you know is hard to imagine having a surplus of housing <laughs> of any kind here but you know i just think it's really important to intentionally mm -hmm. collaborate with other stakeholders including the college and home inc and individual developers thanks marianne that's all yeah, I have. yeah. Um, so I'd like to know if anyone sitting here has anything they'd like to say at this point about the housing needs assessment or the community conversations on housing or housing in general in Yellow Spring. I, I'd like to take a minute and yeah. just again thank everybody on the Housing Advisory Board and especially Kevin for all of his talking and explaining and patience that he he had when he was doing the four sessions I know I was at all four sessions with Kevin and he was very patient in explaining and answering all of the questions and he did so very consistently which is was the goal and um, you did a great job Kevin mm -hmm. this, this, Kevin. I, I, should I, yeah mm -hmm. to, um, to Lisa's last point about terms, because I think that's going to help clarify things. So what I was saying in the presentations is, so I've been working in housing since the late 70s, and somewhere I think in the 90s, affordability became like a euphemism, mm -hmm. whereas in the 70s and 80s, people used to say low-income housing, housing for low-income people, housing for moderate-income people. And so mm -hmm. we might consider going back to maybe not that term but talk about percent of median income mm. because it's more precise and like Lisa was saying affordable a millionaire has to look at affordability and so that doesn't really mean anything and so like 50 percent of median income tends to be viewed by housing and urban development as very low income mm -hmm. 60 percent of median income that's what the low income housing tax credit uses for rental properties. And so those are universally kind of, if, if we were doing something that had federal money in it, those are the kind of definitions they'd be looking for, whereas 80% of median income is moderate income. And I think that helps to get everybody on the same page. And then 120% of median, Often that's, um, sometimes it's called workforce, sometimes it's called middle income housing. But if we looked at median, area median income, percentage of area median income, when we're talking about who is this affordable for, that can get us on the same page. Because what, from, I wasn't here when the glass farm discussion was happening, but what I think happens is people project onto affordable whatever they want and if it's something negative mm -hmm. you can't it's hard to dispel when it's not defined but if we're talking about percentage of, percentage of area median it's clear and it's also clear for those people who don't want it that they can be very clear on what they're talking about mm -hmm. and so I think it it can help the you know it can be a more precise discussion yeah. like well what is wrong with having people who are have incomes of 50 percent or, mm -hmm. or less and there are people who may have legitimate concerns but talking about that so in the developments i was involved in um 
what a lot of that concern was, well, who are they going to be? Who, how, what's the screening? And so if a developer is doing those kinds of buildings, they can talk about this is how the selection process will be um, to, to really address those kinds of concerns. Because what happens with imprecise language is it's so imprecise that a developer can't address it because they're not quite sure what people are talking about. Mm -hmm. And so I think that can really help in terms of clarifying conversations going forward. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Is there, is there anyone else? David? David Turner. Um, I think this is an important thing to talk about, if for no other reason, because I several months ago went back and was looking at a blast several decades at Yellow Springs News, and I was reading the same article over and over, and over again. Um, just a different date on the top with different names of the people having a conversation. So I hope this can be one of the last ones that we have on this. I'm not real sanguine about that because this is only this is complex and there's only so much that the village can do. I'm glad the village is doing something. Don't get me wrong. Um, <coughs> and at the same time, I bet I speak for a number of people in town who I haven't asked when I talk, remember the no sprawl signs and there's a whole lot of told you so, told you so, told you so going on. Um, we don't, the village, I don't assume, spends a whole lot of money on the houses. My understanding is a few thousand bucks in in-kind stuff, you get the land half price, whatever. So quantification of things I think is really important and I like what you're talking about in doing that. Um, and another quantification that might be useful would to, as far as prioritization goes is looking into the poor conditions and what does that mean, how many houses, things like that. Because from what you've said, Patty, there's only so much the village can do. Mm -hmm. And in my travels and my work, I'm in a lot of houses, and there are a couple of times when I thought, this is really bad. Somebody needs to know about this person's situation. And I called the health department. You know, and they said, oh, yeah, we know about that. We can't come in unless we either know something, or we, or we see something, or we're invited. And so stuff can be going on. And when somebody's body gets carried out, I'm sure all the neighbors will say, well, I don't know what they didn't do something. Well, they have their hands tied, just like you do. So some quantification of the poor conditions as an example of quantification of things to help prioritize. Because I read the report, I was in one of the sessions, and it's the same, we need to do more. How much and what? And I think Kevin did a great job of talking about definition of some of those things. It's my standard spiel on quantification and numbers that I will keep giving. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank Appreciate you. that. Hi, my name is Matthew Kirk. Uh, thanks for allowing me to say a few words tonight. You know, I heard everybody up here talk a little bit about uh, various problems we have in our housing market, whether it's deferred maintenance or the quality of homes. Um, and really, when I look at the situation, those are all functions to me of a broken housing market. You know, the reality is because of things like Mary Ann's talked about, the village's anti-growth policy, we have a housing market that functions basically on scarcity. We have a total lack of, and the housing needs assessment back this up. Would they say 500 units is what our market could bear in the immediate future? And so that's a situation we've created. Because the reality is affordable housing is not a naturally occurring thing in a housing market. Because either communities expand their boundaries to allow more housing for people that want to move in via sprawl, or they allow for intensification of land use. So either going up, doing multi-unit buildings, whatever the case may be. In our case is, our policy has been not to do any of those things. So by doing that, we have chosen to create a situation where essentially we're uh, segregating people from the community based on price. It's a socioeconomic uh, tool, but I mean, it's not out of our control. We have caused the situation. And so we can make different choices and change the situation. Uh, a problem of this magnitude you, know, you have to address the scarcity issue. If you look at building anywhere in town here, I mean, there are lots that are selling for sixty-five, seventy, eighty-five thousand dollars. I think I saw a lot go. Somebody even told me somebody bought a house for a half a million dollars, tore the house down, and is building a new one. So essentially, they paid a half a million dollars for a lot. I mean, so that's the kind of crazy things we're talking about happening in our current housing market. And so, 
I don't think there are a lot of small incremental steps. If we try to baby step a solution for this, I don't think you could have that kind of overall impact. I mean, I think, in, and this is just my opinion, but just to open up the idea, let's say we're Yellow Springs, we're gonna do what our housing needs assessment said, or at least we're gonna try to. We're gonna say we're open for business to build 500 houses, and we're gonna put an RFP out to developers, property owners, people who wanna invest in these rental properties. We could have a community real estate investment trust uh, that could help fund some of these things. Um, but it is, it is within the possibility. But only by doing that are you gonna be able to address the scarcity concern and do something to get the price of land down. I mean, if I drive over by those new developments by the Kroger, you see brand new houses there going in for $220,000. And to your point about quality, Kevin, that's the problem is $220,000 here will buy you an 1,100 square foot, three bedroom, one bath ranch that needs everything replaced. And that's, that's a problem. People, especially with young families, are gonna look at that and they go, man, I just struggled to got the, get the money together to buy this house. I don't have the money to buy this house and then fix it all up. And so they go to these other communities because you know, they have good schools too. Uh, you know, we're looking right now at a situation where in this community, we may actually have a school district levy fail, which is unheard of from what I understand. And that largely is coming down to affordability. I haven't heard anybody say they don't want nice schools, they don't think our kids should have high quality facilities. They said, I can't afford this. And that's, that's hard to combat. And so that's, I think, the challenge here is how do we take a real serious bite at that apple? So thank, thank you. you. Matt. Thank you, Matt. Okay, um, Patty, just inform me we have 10 minutes left in the 45. So, so I, am, I am going to assume that Two of you, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, and the two council members who aren't here want council to move forward. Yes. And so I'm going to, I, I will just like to outline what we are thinking of in terms of the out, bare bones outline of the process and do a little explanation of that and get your approval for changing. So the first step in this, we're saying, okay, we need to get information and identify the issues. Well, I think we've gotten a lot of information. I think the issues are there. The second step could be to actually develop a vision and what I've called a policy statement. And I included just a draft mm -hmm. for us, you know. But to say, this is, this is what we want. This is the kind of housing we want for the kind of village that we want, something like that. And then to, to create some specific goals. I mean, we had the housing needs assessment that said within five years, the community could absorb 500 new housing units. Now, we might not want that. We might decide we don't want 500 units in five years or five to 10 years. We might decide, well, we don't necessarily want this number of this kind of units, but we're, I, I'm suggesting that we, that council grapple with some fairly concrete goals of within the five to 10 year period, we would like a certain number of senior condos, uh, a certain number of low income senior condos, you know, et cetera. And then develop the strategies to meet the goals and we have a we we have been compiling a list i mean the village there are a lot of things the village government can't do and there are a lot of things the village government can do especially collaborating and incentivizing and assessing what resources we have to do these things um, and then creating a housing plan a written plan based on the goals the vision the goals and the strategies to do this is going to take some time. And as well has been said, there are opportunities coming up. So I don't think we want to wait until we have a housing plan to start taking advantage of opportunities to start talking with developers. I mean, for example, Kevin uh, has talked with the Housing uh, uh, Advisory Board about the Antioch plan that, that they're going to be coming to uh, Planning Commission with this summer. So, um, 
And then lastly, I said begin implementation. But so some, they, these are not only consecutive steps, they're steps that might be happening at the same time and cycling back and forth. So I'm laying that out and I'm asking, do you want the Housing Advisory Board to come back with a more fleshed out uh, proposal using these kind of steps or? Yes, I would else? like that. Yeah, I definitely want uh, to, to keep the momentum. Uh, I think to, uh, it's, I think it's been said lots of ways. Uh, even part of the information we gathered suggested we've been here before. Um, so I get the sense that it's a little more serious now. I'm not sure why I feel that way. This is my first time I've been involved with the, the, every 10, 15, 25 years talking about housing. But, um, but I think the, the whatever affordability, whatever that thing is that we call affordability, people are feeling it more. Um, and, and I don't remember folks saying, well, I can't afford to leave, live here anymore, so I'm leaving. Um, you know, and so I think, yeah, I think I get the sense that the sense of urgency is greater. Uh, I think we have developed uh, a greater appreciation and, and an appetite for doing what needs to be done this time around. So I don't want to lose momentum, so I say yes, let's do whatever the next steps are. Um, I, I'm, also, I'm also in support. I would request that as part of creating the housing goals that um, this kind of specificity of definition is an early part of setting those goals so that we have a common language. Um, I also think that as it's fleshed out, um, I'll be very interested in early input um, in terms of timing and when and how our, our planning um, body gets involved. And because I think that this is going to be resource draining, it's a lot of work to do, right? So a lot of work for a lot of different people who they're, ec it's not just like you can just kind of think, oh, that sounds like a cool idea. Like you really have to know what you're talking about. <laughs> so I think part of that, uh, I'm not saying that people who are currently involved <coughs> do not know. I'm just saying that as the project gets further along, more and more expertise of different types is going to be needed. So I'm just encouraging of kind of getting in front of that expertise and resource demand question as much as possible. Absolutely support moving forward. Okay. Thank you. So I think we can wrap up this discussion and move on. Thanks. So Lisa, you're on now. Oh boy, here's me again talking about utility affordability and the Roundup program. So um, this is the, this is a third report. <laughs> I was talking about this in February and then in, in, again in April, and you know, trying to adhere to a set of of guiding principles again about um, striving to focus on affordability and take actions to address affordability. And originally began this work. Um, hearing the voice of the community who were expressing the hardship of, of paying the utility increased charges, particularly in the incredibly cold winter. And um, I don't want to lose sight of that. Um, and, and back in, in mid-April, I made a set of recommendations to council um, that are itemized in the packet. I'm not going to repeat what those are. I don't think I need to read them. Um, but what has happened since then um, is uh, an additional um, significant amount of information has been provided about upcoming electric capital costs. And I want to acknowledge and thank Johnny Burns and also Patty Bates mm -hmm. for the work to pull this material together. And I also want to acknowledge that um, I see it as, as an oversight that this information wasn't folded in earlier um, and taken in more into my account with my earlier reports and recommendations. And that was, you know, coming from my desire to, like, move, 
move, move, explore, explore, run models, think about what we can do. So um, I, I guess what I'm doing with this report is inviting everyone to kind of come on the journey that I've been on <laughs> um, of uncovering additional information that I think is absolutely imperative for the community to understand when you look at what our utility rates are and also what actions that we can take. So um, I turn you to this um, pending and projected electric fund capital projects that was a document prepared by um, Johnny Burns and Patty Bates. And this was a really important um, set of information for me because when I first came into council um, early in January, the then finance director um, gave a very positive uh, report on the uh, fund amounts in various um, buckets in the budget. And, and those, those were presented in a very positive way, you know, because there are some funds and they do have money in them. Mm -hmm. And what I understand is that has not always been the case, mm -hmm. yeah. right? And exactly. so there was a very positive message. But speaking for myself as a relative newcomer to the details of the budget, I, I've been really focusing on these budget issues and understanding what these numbers mean and what does it mean if we have unencumbered budget and projected budget and watching these monies move. And if you see something that says you have $2 million in account, then the reaction is like, dang, we have a lot of money. How can the village of Yellow Springs have, uh, you know, all of this money sitting in an account and then still be raising these charges when you can't afford to live here? So that was really the question that I was starting to ask and trying to figure it out. Well, we've been already talking a little bit about how the infrastructure is, we see evidence when we just walk down the street. But I saw this you know, report from Johnny and Patty that, um, that talks about the estimated capital expenses between now, 2018, these are things that are directly related to safety or to deem as deemed essential to keep the electric grid from further deteriorating to things that could be pushed out till 2020 that are over $2 million. And then the balance in the current electrical capital fund balance is a little over $350,000. So then I start asking myself, well, these are things that we have to get done so what's the village, you know, what are we going to do to be able to afford them? And the increase in the rates begin to really make a lot of sense. And um, the, all of these things that are recommended here in terms of an electrical, electrical engineering study of the system, the need for a third circuit that alone will be $700,000, um, you know, polls. You can look at the report yourself. These are all things that are going to be connected to our desire to heal our housing inventory and to create new development. Mm -hmm. So it's, we can't just say, well, we're not going to spend this money. So again, I want to thank um, Johnny Burns and Patty Bates for this information. Um, it, there's kind of two conversations maybe that need to happen. One is a deeper conversation about the upcoming capital projects. I don't know if that's something that the council is going to um, want to talk about more. But let me turn now back to my report. Because I brought up this report just as a way to contextualize my shift in thinking and where I think we should focus going forward. Because I am shifting from what I recommended at the last meeting. You know, as we as we acknowledge tonight, we have a new um, finance person coming on board, and for me, all of this um, figuring out what we can and can't do financially is based on financial models with the budget. And so, based on this additional information about the electric funds and the upcoming capital costs, and given that we have a new finance person coming on board. I really think that for now, I will take off the table or defer 
the recommendation to include 50 kilowatt hours in the basic charge and also, you know, wait for additional analysis on the tiered system. What I heard back from the community is that the um, financial give back of 50 kilowatt hours is not that financially significant in terms of their ability to continue to afford to live in Yellow Springs and that in light of these work that needs to be done, we have to be really frugal and save our money so we can afford to do the capital projects that are much needed. As far as the tiered system, um, there was a lot of enthusiasm about that until we started to realize that by creating a tiered system where the cost went up as usage went up, that we were running the risk of having a negative impact on individuals who live in the village who are the lowest income, like green met housing, who would then be paying the highest rates. And we also started to question how how, did we, how are we incentivizing people who conserved and avoid those negative impacts? Um, then there was also a concern about avoiding disincentive for clean energy usage, which electric utility usage is. Mm -hmm. So um, I don't want to be too glib, but it's like this little kid game called whack-a-mole where like you, you, you hit something, it goes down, and then like something else pops up over there, and then like you hit that, and then something else pops up. That's, that's what this journey has been like. So um, I, I'm, I'm grateful to the patients of this group for these changing recommendations because we don't want to recommend changes that end up having sequelae that even are just more negative. So, um, but you know, as I said, I just want to do, I do want to keep moving forward. So with that in mind, um, I am still proposing and requesting that council agree to eliminate the 5% late <coughs> fee for the first late utility payment each year. I'd ask, uh, Patty was going to quantify that for me. And I, I did as, as much as possible. Mm -hmm. We talked about, because Lisa and I had just talked about this on Friday. And so um, what, what the ladies in the utility office did, we looked at the months of December, January, and February because the December bill is the one that would accrue late payments in January. Actually, yes. Mm -hmm. And so I always have to think that out because we are a month behind. So if you take the people who are late with a December bill and then the people who are late with a January bill and a February bill and you get a quarter of the year essentially. And they're also the quarters where most people are late because you have the holidays, you have the colder weather, you have all of these factors that, that combine together. And the best estimate I can give you right now is that if we were to forgive the first late payment of the year for each account that accrued a late payment, it would be somewhere between six and ten thousand dollars. And it actually came out for the for December of seventeen, January and February of eighteen, it came out to just under seventy five hundred. Um, so you have to assume that there are going to be a few people here and there throughout the year that are gonna, oh, I just forgot, or, you know, I didn't, I lost my job, or something like that, mm -hmm. and you would forgive them their first late payment as it, as it came around. So are you saying that would be for a year or a quarter? For a year, because you would only forgive the first late mm -hmm. payment. Right. And most people, if they're going to be late, that's probably the quarter in which they're gonna be late, is with the December, January, and February bill. So I, I appreciate, you know, that, uh, you know, even if it's a bit of back of the envelope, I appreciate mm -hmm. quantifying it. Mm -hmm. um, I don't want to make it sound like every dollar that the village spends isn't important to consider. Mm -hmm. But for me, even before I knew the dollar amount, this was somewhat of, of a philosophical recommendation that, you know, people make mistakes, they forget, they just, to, you know, it, that that we should just do that. So I, uh, even in light of the quantification, then now stand stand by that recommendation. 
Um, then I also ask Council to approve the formation of a Roundup Advisory Committee. Specifically, what I would recommend that that group do is to quickly establish the standards, guidelines, processes, and procedures of a Roundup program to move to establish a relationship with a 501c3 entity to administer it, to clarify who the responsible persons and groups are, also to provide community education about energy efficiency, and also to evaluate the financial impact of village funding for an efficiency program. And so just to give a little bit more microcode about what that is, there are um, programs that in the past, I think even in Yellow Springs, there was an add-on to charges where then people could take advantage of these programs to improve their insulation and um, learn more and do things. But uh, what I would like the village to look into is the financial impact of having a program like that without passing the charges on to the citizens. So um, those those are the requests that I'm making at this point, um, along with one that the village can, it's, I know it's hard without everybody here, but I would strongly recommend that the council convene a special session, public session, to talk specifically about the uh, upcoming capital projects. Because I think this deserves its own time and focus. And not just in electric, but also in water, water. sewer, and mm -hmm. stormwater, because, and sidewalks. Yeah, I we agree. We might as well include sidewalks, because mm -hmm. right now they're a village responsibility. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, I agree, and I believe Johnny agrees, that the work session is needed. It actually ties into the housing. It does. And so. I mean, don't get me started on water meters. Uh, no, <laughs> no, please. But I, but I would like to. I would like to add a couple of comments to to what Lisa said uh, on the utility roundup. I do have a meeting on Wednesday with Susan Jennings at um, Community Solutions to talk to her about potentially being um, mm -hmm. the 501c3. Um, and also, Johnny and I are meeting on Thursday with Kat Walter to talk about uh, an energy fair and potentially designing some kind of our own energy efficiency program. And also then we're going over to Mills Lawn to talk to Vicki Hitchcock about a PDL on energy conservation and education. So we are working on that and, and the problem that we want to avoid with the energy efficiency program <clears throat> is the one that we had before. In, in that it wasn't really a lot of residents that took advantage of it. It was a lot of the businesses, which I'm not saying that our businesses, <clears throat> excuse me, don't need to be energy efficient, but right now we're trying to really focus on residents. And so the Energy Board has been talking about this and has talked to a couple of different groups about how to do this program. But there's a lot of, there's a problem with trying to focus on residents and what can we do to help residents really um, really work on energy conservation and what can we help them with in their homes that will help them do this on a consistent basis. So we're working on it, Lisa. Yeah, we're, we're, we're moving. And, Thank and, you. And, and I have to say, I, I appreciate your enthusiasm, <laughs> okay? I, because, I mean, I'm kind of like, well, you know, and she's like, no, we got it. I appreciate your enthusiasm. I don't have your level of energy but I do appreciate your enthusiasm. <laughs> Thank you. I'd like to uh, comment, if I may. I, too, appreciate your <laughs> enthusiasm. I appreciate your ideation for modeling. Um, um, and I appreciate your tenacity with this, and it's a great idea. And I agree with all these. Um, I'm going to give uh, Patty a great deal of credit, uh, but then I'll put the HRC label on it, you know, she's, uh, you know, the uh, bill of staff member that's associated with uh, uh, Human uh, Relations Commission, and we've, um, uh, I heard you say quickly, uh, we have not so quickly, but uh, certainly in a positive direction, uh, started making uh, some moves in the direction that this uh, committee that you're referring to would be making. So I would submit that uh, we allow uh, the HRC to continue that work. Mm -hmm. um, again, Patty's really been taking the lead on that, and, and she really 
well, we talked about it at HRC, so I, I do appreciate what, what Patty's doing. So, again, we are making uh, moves in that direction, so I think if we uh, just allow uh, HRC, even as, is, as it is reforming, mm -hmm. um, you know, we've had some moving pieces uh, as of late, um, I think we'll, we'll, we'll get there. So, uh, look, can I ask you, oh, I just, I, we're out okay. of time. Uh, yeah, in the interest of time, I mean, if you had one thing, but but I'd like to get this wrapped up. Understanding mm -hmm. we haven't completed this conversation, right? We are missing two council members. So but. one question I would like to do is maybe um, we can talk about the best way to move quickly forward with standards and processes, whether that's an advisory committee that drafts certain documents that then goes to the HRC to approve, rather than than you know, but have a, a subcommittee that can move more quickly. The two of you we can talk about, about that. Yeah. Yes, Kevin and I'll talk about that. It, okay. And I'd like to ask if anybody, Johnny's been sitting here just in case anybody had any questions about anything that was in the packet related to the electric capital cost. If anyone, or Johnny, do you want to have anything you want to say that hasn't been mentioned? I'm curious. What's the extra circuit for? Uh, Johnny. Mm -hmm. Johnny. For the future development. Uh, right now we've developed a lot of stuff on the West Circuit. Uh, we've had a, a big growth on there. The fire department's moving on the West Circuit. Uh, the water plant increased the load on the West Circuit. Uh, the CBE is, we have Cresco now that's going on the West Circuit. If we want to develop anything else out there on the CBE, we need to free up uh, some power from that circuit move it to a middle circuit or we will create what they call voltage drop and what you'll see is towards the veil and towards the water treatment plant that the power won't be there to be able to run those. So basically you would take a west circuit, you take an east circuit, you take out the middle of it so then the middle would take up some of that load to free up the west and the east. And is this precipitated then by the uh, Cresco development? No, it's not. Yeah. We'd have had to do this regardless. And it also is essential for the development of the glass farm. In Correct. Correct. If we want to do anything on a glass farm, it's it's. We just don't. Happen. We just don't have enough voltage to. I mean, we blown stuff all over the place. Well, and, and it, it comes with a voltage drop issue. Okay. So if we put more on a glass farm, the voltage drop is going to be felt by the customer that's the furthest away. And that's our water plant. And that's plant. our water plant. And the need for the Third Circuit has been on the radar for... Uh, since Zap was here, and that was back in the 90s. Okay. So, Thanks. Thanks. No, it would be substantial by AMP's calculations. It would be substantial to where they, they would fill it and motor would start burning out. It's okay. okay. I, I think okay. we need to... Thank you, Johnny. Thank you, Johnny. Thank you, Johnny. Okay, Lisa, you're up. For Me this. again. All right, so I'm bringing back to the table the uh, Village of Yellow Springs incentive policies. This is work that's been going on by um, economic sustainability. In total, there's three documents. I think only two are in the packet. Um, the third was brought a month or so ago. That's a, just an application form that goes along with the incentive policies. Uh, uh, when this came up at the last meeting, um, Patty brought up a really good point that it would be helpful to have some sort of a scoring sheet. So the uh, commission mocked one up that could be used when these applications um, come in. Uh, the, the proposed process, which is not described in the policy, um, but could be described um, uh, um, if, if you wanted it added would be that a, a person or entity requesting an incentive would fill out an application. It would come to the village manager. The village manager would use this to score it, um, make a determination if he or she wanted to bring it to council. Council would bring it forward for a vote and it would pass by a majority. Um, so we decided to bring these forms uh, forward one more time um, without the, um, like not for a vote, but that we could bring it forward for a vote the next time unless there's questions or comments from those present. Just, is this the latest? I know you uh, were saying. Yeah, the, the only thing that's new um, is the rating sheet. Mm -hmm. 
Um, one question that was asked about the rating sheet was whether the overall benefit rating was some kind of like an average of the different answers, you know, divided by the number of questions. <coughs> and actually it's not because some of the questions are yes, no. And in some cases the right answer is yes. And in some cases the right answer is no. So this is geared to decrease subjectivity but still allow the person who's evaluating the over pa overall package to just give it a benefit rating from zero to four based on what they're seeing. Okay, that's it. That was faster than there you the go. amount of time. Yep. Made, made time up. Just, just by a little okay. bit. So we'll any, any disagreement, we'll bring it back at the next meeting. Is yeah. a, does it come as a? Well, that was my question. Do you want to bring it back as a resolution with an attachment? Yeah, I think that the attachment should probably be the, the policy, the application, and the scoring sheet, have it all together in one. Right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Okay. Uh, new business. And the new business is a nomination for our environmental commission. So um, Lisa and I interviewed Matthew Lawson, who is a relatively new resident of Yellow Springs, uh, coming from Canada. And I think, uh, did you all see the, or Kevin, did you see the? Yes. Mm -hmm. So Matthew has a pretty, for, for a relatively young person, he has a pretty extensive background in environmental issues and um, very energetic guy. And um, Lisa and I both thought he would be a good addition to the Environmental Commission. So um, I would like to nominate him for that. I second that. Okay. Um, call vote. Voice vote. Everyone say yes. Yes. Everyone yes. <laughs> say yes. <laughs> you don't get to tell me. <laughs> you don't get to tell me what. All those in favor, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> vote yes. Right. Yes. Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. okay. We did that. Okay. <laughs> Stumbled through that. <laughs> now the manager's report. Okay, I'm just going to highlight a couple of things because my report is a bit more lengthy in complying Thank with you. council's request to yes, tell I you really what appreciate the heck that. is going on in all the departments. Um, I do want to note that um, there you are not allowed to post political candidate signs, political issue signs, or signs saying choose my business on village property um, because we don't let anybody do that on our property. And if you happen to be missing any of those signs, they would be down in the police department. So uh, please stop down there and pick them up. And keep in mind that you're not allowed to post those on any village owned properties. Um, because of a one day delay in getting the bills out to residents this month, late fees will not be posted on the at 8 a.m. on the 16th like they normally will, but instead will be posted at 8 a.m. on the 17th. That gives you that one extra day because we got your bill to you late. Um, that is only for this month, but please be aware of it. Um, crew quarters are going to hopefully be up July 1st, and my crew wants you to know how happy they are going to be to have be able to sit and have lunch and, and uh, safety training without having the rain come in underneath the walls. Um, Cresco's moving along, everybody's cutting a lot of grass, and I think we mentioned everything else during my announcements. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Chief? Chief. Good evening. Good evening. I am pleased to announce <laughs> our community outreach specialist, Ms. Florence Randolph, is already doing an amazing <coughs> job. Um, it's difficult because we get pulled away during the day and then I come back and I see she's at it and making things happen. She has been helping people in need, connecting them with the proper resources from providing assistance and housing, health equipment to our issues and victims of drug and alcohol abuse. Um, I have to say, Florence is filling a huge void in the department since I took over. We have two new officers in training, as you know, so if you see Richard or Paul out on the street, please say hello, introduce yourself, 
and give them a warm village welcome. Any I questions? Hug. I hug. <laughs> we can we can <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Florence. Chris? Very briefly. Um, just to give council a heads up, uh, the governor signed the legislation for these small cells, uh, and so we have until July 30th to get that legislation passed. We're working on it this week, uh, but there's no rush. Uh, we've got plenty of time to get it done. But we're now ready to get to the next step to present the legislation. Great. Thanks. Great, thank you. And oh, Chris. What are small cells? The mini cell towers that are designed to improve Wi-Fi throughout communities that are attached to existing and municipal owned structure telephone poles. Oh. Like there's some restrictions we can place on them. Okay, it's me. <laughs> right. Well, I'm going to hold forth a bit on public records. Uh, first, I'll just remind everyone to remember to vote tomorrow. <laughs> Lest wow. that slipped your attention locally. <laughs> um, <laughs> sorry. Uh, so we have had a flurry of public records requests in the last few weeks, and this has, in fact, been going on for some period of time. Usually, we get these huge upticks, and then it drops off a bit, and we forget to be nervous about it and then it flares back up again. But in the past few weeks, um, I thought I would just sort of say how much, you know, kind of, kind of volume we've had. So in the last four weeks, <clears throat> through my office, we've had a total of 18 requests for public records. And that has resulted in the following amount of time spent in fulfillment of those record requests. And this is just in four weeks. Police Department, 24 hours. Coolidge Wall, 6.1 hours. Mayor's office, 1.5 hours. Manager's assistant, two hours. Payroll clerk, two hours. Clerk of council, 10 hours. And those, uh, and I, that's a typo, it is 18. Those 18 requests came from a total of eight persons, and three of those persons constituted 13 of the total requests. And we are still in process. We're certainly not done with, with that flurry. Wow. Um, you know, I just counted up the hours. 45.6 hours for essentially a month. That's like a quarter time equivalent a month that we're having to either hire someone new for public records requests, I don't think so, or that take away time from the police doing their work or we have to probably pay extra to <laughs> Well, I here. And I'm just going to say that I think Judy's hours are conservative, or estimates are conservative. Okay. We, we so know they are, I know they are for Ruth Ann. I, know like, they are for I mean, I don't think this is coming from the Yellow Springs News, I don't think. I mean, what, who is, what, what are, what is going on? What? Yeah. I can answer this question. <laughs> <laughs> Chris, do you want to I give an answer to this? They, they are what they are. We, we are required to answer public records requests to the best of our ability. The, the law is written very broadly, and it's part of a, an effort to be transparent uh, with government, which if I think all of us would agree is, is, a, is not only noble, it's essential to an open society. Um, however, uh, if one thinks that this is a, a challenge for the village in terms of the time that's spent, many, many communities throughout the the state are frustrated by the same uh, challenges of, of serial public requesters asking uh, over and over again for information. I think that one of the challenges that often exists is that the requests are not precisely made. And it's very difficult sometimes to understand what the requester is asking for. And it's not the job of the municipality in this case, it could be Judy who's responding, or at least ultimately she's the one who's the conduit to uh, the municipality to translate the request. And uh, many of the requests are overbroad, so there's a back and forth. Um, and sometimes requesters feel that they're being um, uh, challenged on their authority or their right, not authority, but their right to get the information. And that's not the case at all. Uh, in fact, 
the, the more precise the request is, the easier it is for us to get that information, which we want to do. We have no, in, no incentive, no desire to make this process any more difficult or challenging or time consuming than it needs to be. Uh, but uh, we would simply ask people who want public records to be as precise as they can for the information they request. We are not allowed by law to ask why somebody wants it. Um, somebody is entitled, people are entitled to ask anonymously for the information. Um, so uh, we are constrained, uh, but we can follow up to say we need more information or this is a vague or overbroad request. And I can assure you that we do our best to comply with the law, uh, which requires reasonable response times and uh, to uh, produce the information in the manner or the format that the requester asked for. Is, is there any kind of um, written um, something that we could write up to help people narrow in their requests? I, I mean, I, I have to say, I wonder if it's, some of this is just harassment. But having a less uh, negative view, is it people that are, think we're trying to hide something? So, um, I mean, we don't know that we don't really know, but if we could give some kind of written thing saying that this is, this is the best way to make a public record request so we can give you exactly what you want. I, I, I would say in a generic sense, yes, um, but there are also resources out there that are publicly available. There's the Ohio Sunshine Manual that, that explains the process. In fact, it's a resource that Judy and I routinely use because it's a, it's a compilation of all the laws and that, uh, that municipalities have to operate under. Um, but fundamentally, if a requester doesn't want to educate him or herself on the best way to do it, there's not much that we can do. Well, I think the frustrating thing from my position, and I am that person who has to say, well, this is, you know, this is too broad and here's why this is too broad. I'm frequently in that position. I think the frustrating part is that I think often folks know what they are looking for, but they're fearful of asking for that because they assume that it will be then hidden from them or taken from them or not revealed because we're fearful of revealing it. And, it, and I would liken it really quite honestly. I get a paycheck regardless of what I give you. <laughs> so really I want to give it to you and the easier I can give it to you, the better, quite frankly. But it's a bit like, I mean, I've, I think the analogy is apt because if I have a senior thesis that I need to write and I walk into the library and I say, I need a book, and I need it today, and I need it on something very interesting, you will get a response that says, well, I need your subject matter. I need You, you will be asked to narrow your request quite logically um, so that that individual can give you the best response possible. And um, usually when that back and forth starts, not usually. For a very few requesters who request very frequently, when the back and forth begins to occur, there's an immediate wall that goes up of suspicion that I think reinforces their thought that they've got to be as vague as possible or they're not going to get what they ask for. The irony is that those folks who come in and say, boy, I'm looking for this particular smoking gun on this particular person, and I think it happened around here, it's so easy to fulfill that request. And that's the irony. I mean, I think there's much more time wasted in trying to figure out what it is that you are asking for from the folks who think that we're trying to hide things from them that they're asking for, if that makes any sense. It does. So just ask for what you want. <laughs> I have nothing to add to that. <laughs> <laughs> she does have good analogies. <laughs> I like that, yeah. Hmm. Either of you have... Well, I mean, just the, the quantification that it's a, you know, a quarter of a full-time person, given all the work that there is to do. I mean, I, I, I'd like to think that the requesters are balancing whatever positive impact they're trying to have on the quality of life in Yellow Springs with the impact of the request. You know, I mean, it's a lot of hours. And, and for those who don't know, um, with respect to the amount of time that's put forth, um, you know, 
we as a government entity are not able to charge any of that time. We can only charge for the actual material cost, the paper or the CD or whatever um, that it's on. So it, we're obligated to provide the information and, and all we get from it is the joy of having completed the request. It, and frequently, if, and Judy, correct me if I'm wrong, we don't charge because it's more hassle to write the, get an invoice out and get the payment than well, we, we generally don't if it's under a certain amount because you're correct in that in that way. We have had folks who've, who have required, who have requested large volumes of things and it is a little bit satisfying to charge and then that we always donate those, those funds to the code fund, which is kind of a nice feeling because you think, oh well, out of all this at least the code fund got a little bit of... So you'd boost. prefer that people not make the request and just donate to the code fund? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Again. Not quite that. No. Or make a specific. Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. And, and, and as Judy said, the irony is nobody's trying to hide anything. Just explain to us what you want, and we'll give you what you asked for. But right. we have to know what it, we have to know what it is you want in order to provide it. Right. Well, and I will make a distinction since I, I have a moment that there is a difference between the Freedom of Information Act and a public records request. Freedom of Information is for information, and it is federal. And public records are state level, and they are for they are for, they are for records. So we don't we aren't obligated to provide information. We are obligated to provide records that already exist. Correct. And if we can create them simply and easily, we do uh, to to fulfill certain requests. But no, we are there is not an obligation to create a non-existent record. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think we are at the last event of the night, which is the future agenda items, and we have a list for May 21st, and I think we've added some things. I do want to say that the May 21st list includes two justice system task force issues, and we had agreed to only take one, so um, I don't know how that decision is going to be made. but. Um, I'm going to make a note of that. Uh, and other things that we've talked about are the tree committee discussion, which I'm going to suggest probably we move to a later, yes. unless it seems like we have time on the 21st. But we have the utility roundup and the utility roundup, the incentive policies, the, the having a capital project special meeting. Mm -hmm. We were suggesting that, so. I was. Maybe we, we could we set that. that on as a topic to, to yeah. send that. Yeah, yeah, let's do it. And is it a resolution to waive the 5% late fee? Is that how that, or is it bigger than that? Well, it's a change in the ordinance. It's, got, it's gonna be right, Chris, it's a change in the utilities ordinance. So that's. For a late fee? Because the late is part of the ordinance. It's expressly in there, and it probably does need to be an ordinance. Yeah. So, yeah, it'll be an ordinance, and that'll be two reads and then 30 days from the second read for effect. Um, okay. But um, I also need to add a resolution for a pole replacement, um, the ones that we can't, we can't do in-house. Johnny wants to bring uh, a resolution for part of them, actually 11 of them, to the next meeting. Okay. On the, uh, the mini cell towers, uh, if the, I'm thinking that maybe we bring it on June 4th. Uh, mini for the aesthetic? Well, yeah, that, that whole chapter. And then we can have the second reading, the second meeting in June, 30 days after. Also, um, the fourth grade class, uh, Shannon Wilson's class that did their, all their work on affordable housing. Oh, and they will be, have, they will be involved in the Mills Lawn, what's it called, exhibition night on mm. Wednesday, Wednesday, Wednesday night. They would like to come and do a little presentation on what their research has found. And 
if they could come right at the beginning of the 21st, you know, for like five minutes, if we can do that, I would like to do that. The whole class wouldn't come. There'd be a, they'd have a representative, a couple of representatives from their class. The Mills Lawn. Five thirty. I thought it was six. Well, unless that's just kindergartners, sorry, it's my base of knowledge may be limited. Oh yeah, I, I didn't I, write that. I don't know. I have, I have it at six, but that doesn't mean it's different times for different grades. Oh, Let's see. Okay, thank you. Okay, so the kindergartners, kindergartners at five thirty. <laughs> so it starts at five thirty, chief. And then it got walked by to school that morning. Right. Yes. Yeah. Um, okay, so we have a ton of of uh, legislation yes. at the next meeting, and we do. I will read extremely rapidly, and if you would just make sure you read those legislative briefs, they are literally sometimes two words change right. in an ordinance, so it's one. very minor stuff for all and of the mm -hmm. Planning Commission. And maybe yeah. we'll decide some of these things need to get on. Yeah. Anything else? About agenda planning? Well, speaking of bumping, yeah. are yeah. you going to be prepared for, well, do you want to keep the Tobacco 21 discussion on? Well, we probably should because I sent out the letters um, okay. that everybody, Sorry. so the Tobacco 21 is probably the one that has to stay on there. Okay. We could move the fees for event service discussion. Or the diversity outreach hiring because we're still working e either on Either or both of yeah. those. We're still working on that. I'm in favor of moving diversity outreach hiring policy direction. I'll, I'll we'll note it and then when we do mm -hmm. agenda planning that can so noted if they can mm -hmm. see what can okay. shift. Okay, are we are we complete um, with this? I think uh, I move to adjourn the Monday, May 7th meeting of the Village Council of Yellow Springs. I second said okay. meeting or motion. I, I agree. <laughs> are we all in favor? Yeah, I think we, we are. are. Yes. Yes.